Adam the first and the last. And we're going to be looking at whether there was a first man named Adam, because we know we live in a world today which mocks and scoffs at the Bible, but ever more in the church, um, we see Christian theologians, Christian apologists begin to reinterpret and deny the existence of the first man, Adam. And when we do this, there are serious theological implications. So this is the, the subject we're going to look at today. But I want to begin by taking you to the Natural History Museum in London. If you've ever been to the United Kingdom, been to London, you would probably maybe visited the Natural History Museum. It is a great museum with lots of great things to see inside. But sadly, when you go through those doors, the first person you meet is Charles Darwin. This is because the Natural History Museum basically has taken Darwin's view of evolution of millions of years. And that's the view you basically get when you are in that museum. Now, there's an interesting, uh, one of the rooms that you go interest in, there's an interesting video that you get to watch. And we're gonna look at this now and the person presenting in the video is a man by the name of Sir David Attenborough. Now, David Attenborough is a famous scientist around the world, primarily because of the television programs he produces. Now, I want you to listen to what he has to say because he's asking the question, who do we think we are? So I want you to listen to what he has to say. to take you on a journey, a journey to discover who you really are and where you came from. But you're not just going to sit there listening to me, you're going to be part of the experience and you'll be able to examine some of the evidence for evolution along the way. Have a look at your screens now, you can rotate the modern human skull and you'll see the domed forehead, the small face, the small front teeth and on the lower jaw, the chin. If you keep looking through your screen, you will see Australopithecus afarensis, an extinct hominid who lived about three million years ago. These sea anglers live at a depth in the ocean below a thousand meters where there's no light, so they're living in total darkness. It was our fishy ancestors that first developed some of our most fundamental features, our skeleton, jaws, and four limbs. Hold up your screen and look through it one last time. You'll see the tree that represents all of life, past and present. We started this film with a question, who do you think you are? And we can end it with an answer. You are undoubtedly, like every other living thing on earth, a member of one single family of life descended from a common ancestor living thousands of millions of years ago. So who do you think you are, according to David Attenborough and the Natural History Museum? Well, basically, according to their view, you're descended from a common ancestor. In fact, if you listen to one of the men in the clip, he says, your ancestors were fish. And this is an important question for us to think about. Who do you think you are? Because in the world that we live in, we know that the evolutionists teach this. Professor Stephen Hawking, who was a famous scientist, one of the world's leading scientists until he died a few years ago at Cambridge University, was asked this question. And he said, we are just an advanced breed of monkeys. And then Professor Peter Atkins from Oxford University in the United Kingdom um, a professor of chemistry was asked this question as well from a leading um, newspaper over here in the UK. And he answered, we are just a bit of slime on a planet. Imagine that, just a bit of slime on a planet. You know, no wonder people have such a dismal outlook on life today. No wonder so many people face depression, anxiety, when you think about the worldview they've inherited from the culture that we live in, that they're just a bit of slime on a planet. You're just related to the monkeys. You're just an advanced monkey. That's all you are. You know, it's important to think about these worldview issues because the importance of this is that if Adam is in your past, if there was a first man named Adam, if Adam is in your past, then God 
is the authority. God sets the rule. God determines what is right and wrong. Marriage has a basis, has a meaning in history because God literally made one man and one woman to begin with and join them together in marriage. You know, euthanasia, abortion would be killing people because only God has the right to take life. We cannot do that. And God determines what life is. God is the one who sets the rules and ha has the authority over us. That is if Adam is in our past. And, and many years ago, people would have accepted that view. They would have accepted God as creator. But today, because of the influence of evolution, we see people believe, no, Adam isn't in your past. Ape is in your past. We're descended from ape-like creatures. Well, if that's the case, then basically it's not God who sets the rules, but relative morality exists where man determines what is right and what is wrong. If you think about in the book of Judges, you read that famous passage, when there was no king in Israel, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that's the world, the Western world at least, in which we live in today. People base their um, morality off their subjective feelings, but you can't live consistently with relative morality because ultimately it's, it's self-defeating. You need objective morality to determine right and wrong and you can only get objective morality from god you don't need to believe in god but you do need god for objective morality in fact darwin in his book the origin of the species never touched on the origin of man when he wrote this book in 1859 but at the end of his book he did say this in the distant future, I see open fields for far more important researchers. Light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. And then in 1871, he released his book, um, The Descent of Man, in which he proposed, as you can see there on the screen, our early progenitors lived on the African continent. And that is part and parcel of the evolutionary worldview today, that we came out of Africa. In fact, the evolutionary history of man basically teaches Humans split from chimpanzees around 3 million years ago, and that modern humans evolved somewhere in Africa around 100,000 to 200,000 years ago from a population of people. That is the evolutionary view of the history of mankind. Now, this view is beginning to impact and has done for the last decades, in fact, it has impacted the church. But more increasingly, we're seeing leading theologians, leading apologists, begin to deny this doctrine of a first man, Adam. In fact, the, the leading Christian magazine probably in the world, maybe uh, Christianity Today, had a lead article back in 2011 entitled The Search for the Historical Adam. And you can see there on the front cover, it said this, some scholars believe genome science cast doubt on the existence of the first man and woman. And then it says, others say the integrity of the faith requires it. And we would say, it answers in Genesis, that the integrity of the faith requires, sorry, that there be a first man and a first woman. In fact, you can see there, if you look at the picture, even before you open up the magazine, Christianity today have already come to their conclusion who they think Adam is. They're not without a bias. They have a bias and they believe Adam evolved from ape-like creatures. In fact, in 2019, just last year in January, they had another article, 10 Theses on Creation and Evolution that most evangelicals can support. Now, we would disagree with many of the conclusions they come to in this article, but the author says this, I suspect in 20 years' time, support for Adam and Eve as real persons in a real past will be a minority view, even within evangelicalism. And we can see why that is from the number of books and articles being written by leading apologists and theologians that are influencing the church today. And we're going to look at some of those now. And a man who's done a lot to influence this is a man called Francis Collins, who was actually picked by President Obama, former President Obama, to be um, the leader of the Human Genome Project. But in 2007, he wrote this book, The Language of God, A Scientist Presents Evidence. And in the book, he basically argues that Genesis is, is a myth, it's poetry, it doesn't teach us any history. Adam and Eve never existed, he, he tells us in that book. But he also writes this, population genetics 
looks at these facts about the human genome and conclude that they point to all members of our species having descended from a common set of founders, approximately 10,000 in number, who lived 100,000 to 150,000 years ago. Now, his, his view on this has influenced many people today. For example, one man who's been influenced by Collins is Dennis Lamoureux, and he wrote a paper in the book, uh, Four Views of, on the Historical Adam. He wrote the evolutionary creation view, which he tells us this. My central conclusion in this book is clear. Adam never existed. And this fact has no Im Im um, impact whatsoever on the foundational beliefs of Christianity. I simply want evangelicals to be aware that there are born again Christians who love the Lord Jesus and do not believe there were, was ever a first man named Adam. Now let's deal with the second part of that to begin with. You can be a born again Christian and believe God used evolution. We've never denied that, but you cannot be a consistent Christian as we're going to see from Lamoureux's conclusions because Lamoureux says that denying Adam does not impact the foundational beliefs of Christianity whatsoever. Well, we would disagree because Lamoureux has had to um, reject the doctrine of the inerrancy of scripture. He's had to reject the doctrine of original sin. And he, he even denies that Christ was teaching truth when he taught on Genesis, because in another book he wrote called Evolution, Scripture, and Nature Say Yes, he wrote this, powerful evidence for a strict literal reading of the Genesis creation account comes from Jesus himself. So note there, first of all, he recognized that Jesus clearly believed in the history and the authority of the book of Genesis, but he has a reason not to believe Jesus because he goes on to say, however, in Matthew 19, 4 and 5, Jesus accommodated by employing the ancient signs to emphasize the inerrant spiritual truth that God is a creator of human beings. So he's basically arguing that Jesus just accommodated um, his teaching to the people of the time because they didn't know any better. So Jesus accommodated to the prevailing opinion that Genesis was history. But here's the thing. When you read the Gospels, Jesus never accommodated to anyone. He was constantly rebuking and correcting the Pharisees and the Sadducees for their misapplication of Scripture, for the wrong interpretation of Scripture. So Jesus never accommodated his views on Scripture to anyone. In fact, Jesus clearly believed, as Lamoro tells us, that Jesus believed that Genesis was history. And so if Jesus is our Lord and Savior, then we need to believe what Jesus believed about Genesis. And Jesus never accommodated to anyone. In fact, Lamoro says there, he talks about the inerrant spiritual truth in the Bible because he's had to reject the history and the implications that the Bible has on scientific truth in the Bible because of his view of evolution. So he's had to reject these vital doctrines. Another man who's had great influence is a man from my own country in England, Dr. Dennis Alexander, who wrote a book in 2014 called Creation or Evolution, Do We Have to Choose? And he basically argues, yes, we have to choose. And what you have to choose is that God used evolution to create. But his position on Adam and Eve is on the screen where he tells us God in his grace chose a couple of Neolithic farmers in the Near East to whom he chose to reveal himself in a special way, calling them into fellowship with himself so that they might know him as a personal God. So Alexander's position on Adam and Eve is that they are Neolithic farmers. Now, if you've ever read Genesis 2 and 3, I'm sure you come to the conclusion that Adam and Eve are Neolithic farmers. Well, no, you didn't because the Neolithic period is an evolutionary interpretation of the data. It has nothing to do with observational evidence, but Alexander has had to impose that view upon the text. Another man who has great influence on many people today in the church is John Walton. Over the last decade or so, he's written a series of books called The Lost World Series. And the book you can see on the screen is The Lost World of Adam and Eve, which touches upon, obviously, the subject of Adam. And in the book, he basically argues the core proposal of this book is that the formation accounts of Adam and Eve should be understood archetypally rather than accounts as how those two individuals were uniquely formed. So he basically tells us that when you read Genesis 2, because um, it's set in the ancient Near East and 
the, the, the authors have been influenced by this ancient Near Eastern thinking, you have to read Genesis 1 to 11, basically, not as material accounts of origins, but as functional accounts of the origins of the world. And he says that you have to understand, understand Adam archetypally. Why? Because he would argue that, and this is true, in Hebrew, the name Adam can also be understood as mankind, and it can be, but it also can mean a personal name, Adam. But he would say in Genesis 2, it never means a personal name, it just rather means mankind. So he rejects the fact that this has to do with two individuals being uniquely created. He does believe Adam was a historical person, and he argues that's because in the New, the New Testament authors basically believe Adam is historical. Another man who's had great influence in the church today and was a good scholar, um, conservative in many views, but in his book, Did Adam and Eve Really Exist? He says, if you're going to come to a conclusion about who Adam and Eve are, then basically you need to believe Adam would be the chieftain of a tribe. And again, when you read Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to look at Genesis 2 in a moment, you would never come to the conclusion that Adam is a chieftain of a tribe because there are no other people around. Again, this is because he, he is being influenced by uh, the idea of evolution and millions of years and has to read that into the text to come up with Adam being the chieftain of a tribe. And then finally, William Lane Craig. William Lane Craig is one of the leading Christian apologists in the, in the church today. In fact, he's done great work on things like the resurrection but in other areas of his apologetics, you need to be really careful and discerning of how he understands things, especially when it comes to Genesis, because he basically argues today that Genesis is mytho-historic. Mytho it's not literal history. It's not factual history. It's mytho-historic. And he believes in what he calls limited inerrancy, which, which is a strange thing, because Jesus and the apostles never believed in limited inerrancy but in this article on his website he tells us this what is essential i think is affirming the universality of sin and the need of every human being of god's saving grace that doesn't require a historical adam now that's a strange thing to say that the universality of sin doesn't require a historical adam but he goes on for me then the central theological issue raised by the historical adam will be not original sin or the fall but rather biblical inspiration and authority. Can we, in a scientific age, trust what the Bible teaches? And what he means by scientific age there is an age which has been influenced by evolution and millions of years, which has nothing to do with observational science, you know, being able to repeat te a test and um, observe things. It's part of historical science science, your belief about the past when you weren't there to see what went on. And so this is a biblical authority issue. And we would say, yes, you can believe the Bible when it touches upon Genesis. Sadly, Craig doesn't believe you, you can do so. He doesn't really believe in a historical, um, at the first man, Adam, he would believe Adam existed, but he rejects the fact that Adam was the, was the first person in human history. And so we need to realize that a number of doctrines are redefined when you start to add evolution and long ages into the Bible. For example, creation in six days. When you read the text of Genesis 1, it's clear that God created everything supernaturally um, over the period of six days. Of course, those, the, the days are defined by evening and morning. And then in Exodus 20, 11, it's a really clear text speaking on the fact that God made everything in six days. The image of God has to be redefined because if Adam wasn't the first man and there were other people before him, then of course Adam wasn't uniquely created in God's image. Original sin, many of these people, you heard Dennis Lamoureux rejected the doctrine of original sin. William Lane Craig doesn't think it's important. This is because, again, if other people were, were around before Adam and Eve, then yeah, Adam wasn't the first person to sin against God and bring death and suffering into creation. The inerrancy, authority, infallibility, and perspicuity of Scripture are clearly being redefined. The perspicuity of Scripture basically has to do with its clarity. And Jesus, in those passages you can see there, clearly believed 
in the infallibility and inerrancy and clarity of scripture think about how many times you read jesus say have you not read it is written and he refers to adam he refers to abel he refers to noah he refers to sodom and gomorrah he clearly accepted the old testament as being historical and reliable and then christology you have people like lamaro and others saying you know what jesus was a man of his time he had to accommodate to his cult the culture but when you read passages like matthew 15 jesus corrects the culture he is never corrected by the culture or never accommodates to the culture. And so we need to realize these doctrines are being redefined in the church today. So let's now look at this doctrine of creation, the creation of Adam. But we need to first just look quickly at the days of creation because, as I said a moment ago, when you look at Genesis 1, it's quite clear in English and in Hebrew when you read it. It's a historical narrative that uses um, verb forms in Hebrew uh, used elsewhere of, of, of history, the Vav consecutive, it defines days by even and morning. And it's clear that Adam is created on day six of creation week. And so Genesis one gives you the big picture of creation. And then in Genesis two, which many theistic evolutionists would argue is a separate account of creation. It's not, it just focuses in on day six of creation because it looks at the creation of man because it's man who is uniquely made in god's image and so the biblical history of man is very different to the evolutionary history of man adam and eve are created on day six of creation week from the genealogies given in genesis 5 and 11 you know we would understand this to have occurred around six thousand years ago when you look at the genealogies it's clear that from Adam to Abraham is around 2,000 years. From Abraham to Christ is around 2,000 years. And then from Christ to us is around 2,000 years. That's where we get the 6,000 years from. And many people try and argue that there are gaps in the genealogy, so you can't get that time frame. But we would say, no, those genealogies given on broken chronology of Adam to Abraham. In fact, when you read um, the book of Jude in the New Testament, Jude tells us Enoch is the seventh from Adam. And that's what you read when you read Genesis 5. In fact, the age of the patriarch is given when the son is born. And so we know they give a father, son, descendant. Adam is 130 years old, for example, when Seth is born. And so when you read Genesis 2, we have to remember this is not a separate account of creation. It is uh, day six of creation week. And it begins by telling us this, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created and that those words there these are the generations are, are, is the hebrew word toledot and you you see that word throughout the book of genesis because it's a historical marker not just in the early chapters but it runs throughout the book of genesis in fact it's used in genesis 5 1 to speak of the descendants of adam it's used in uh, Genesis 6 9 to give the descendants of uh, to speak of Noah his Toledot and then it's used in Genesis 10 1 to speak of Noah's son Shem Ham and Japheth and their descendants so this is a historical marker that's used throughout uh, the book of Genesis and it's interesting everywhere else in the book of Genesis it begins with a personal name and the only time it doesn't begin with a personal name is here in Genesis 2 4 and that's because Adam had no predecessors. There was no person before Adam, which is why you can read that in verse five, where it tells us, and there was no man to work the ground. And this is why God creates Adam from the dust of the ground. Because in Genesis 2, 7 and 8, we read this, and the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. And so we see there God forms Adam literally from the dust of the ground. And that word formed in Hebrew, Yatsar, is used elsewhere in the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, to speak of God as a, as a potter. And here we see God form Adam from the dust. And dust isn't a metaphor for something here because if you look up there on the screen, if you read Genesis 319, Adam literally goes back to the dust 
of the ground because he disobeyed God. So dust isn't a metaphor for some ape-like creature or something else. It's Adam being literally created from the dust of the ground. And it tells us that God planted a garden in Eden. Now we need to realize the garden in Eden is not Eden. It's a place. Eden is a larger geographical location. So God creates Adam and he places in him in Eden in, in Genesis 2.15. It tells us he created him to tend and keep the garden. But in Genesis 2.18 to 20, um, it tells us some more important information about Adam because it tells us that the Lord God said it is not good this is on day six of creation before God summed up everything is very good. It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. This is why God creates Eve. But think about that. It is not good that Adam should be alone. Well, Dennis Alexander's view of Adam was that he was a Neolithic farmer. C. John Collins's view of Adam was that he was a head of a tribe. Well, if Adam was either of those things, then he wouldn't be, he, there would be other people around. He wouldn't be alone. But Genesis 2, 18 tells us Adam was alone. And John Walton tries to argue that the first time the word Adam is a personal name is in Genesis 5, 1. But if you can see there, I've highlighted the word Adam because in Hebrew, it's lay Adam. And it appears here as a proper name since it appears in Hebrew without the definite article, which indicates it is a proper name. And so we see here, the man is identified as Adam. It's a, it's a, it's a one individual who God is gonna now form Eve from his side from. So we see Genesis 2 clearly teaches Adam was a uniquely formed individual who was by himself in the garden until Eve was formed. But what about this idea of population genetics? Now, I'm not going to go um, too deep into this. There's other resources that can help you with that. But we need to think about the assumptions that are going on because we need to realize when it comes to genetics or when it comes to any branch of science, where we all have influences, we all have biases. And we would say today, predominantly, most scientists work from a naturalistic bias. Man's word in this era of history would say that's evolution and millions of years where as christians we want to say no the foundation of our thinking needs to be god's word needs to be how we view the world even when we come to um, thinking about foundationally about genetics because basically when evolutionists um, look at genetics they have at least three in assumptions that help in them to come to their conclusion about genetics and population genetics for example, deep time, the idea of long ages of history, common ancestry, the fact that we go back to um, chimpanzees about three million years ago in Africa where there was a break off there. And then 100 to 150,000 years ago, um, modern man came out of Africa. That's their view of the history of man. And then mutations, which are the driving force behind evolution you know but when you really understand mutations it doesn't help molecules to man evolution but those are the three basic assumptions of population genetics that help them come to this conclusion of 10,000 people coming about 150,000 years ago but if we're thinking biblically then we need to start with biblical assumptions that god created adam and eve to begin with one man and one woman and a number of creation scientists have argued that basically Adam had mature DNA. In other words, he was created with millions of DNA differences to begin with, which would give him the ability to have diverse and unique offspring. And then another event would have implications on this subject, the global flood in Genesis six to eight, because what happens there? God reduces the population to eight people in other words there's a bottleneck um, Noah and his wife get on the ark as do Shem Ham and Japheth and their three wives and so the population is reduced to eight people and then we see at the time of the Tower of Babel there's a partitioning of the genes that were formerly on board the ark because God disperses the people because of their disobedience around the world so those genetic pools are moved scattered all across the world that's our 
biblical set of assumptions when it comes to looking at genetics. In fact, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen, using these assumptions, has come to great conclusions and, and even made predictions in his book, Replacing Darwin, The New Origins of Species. So if you want to look into this um, a bit more, then I would um, say, make sure you get this book, Replacing Darwin. I think he's even got a smaller version of this, Replacing Darwin, made simple. Get your hands on this book if you want to know more about this issue because I don't have the background to go into all the technical information. We want to look at the big picture here. So when we look at the biblical view of man, we, we realize Adam and Eve to begin with, Noah and his family where there was that um, population bottleneck and then God dispersed people around the world at the time of the Tower of Babel. So in the evolutionary view of things, it's man came out of Africa, but we would say, no, it's out of Ararat, not Africa, because man came from um, the, middle, the Middle East, not out of Africa. But what do we do with things like Lucy, who was found in Ethiopia in 1974 by Dr. Donald Johansson, other work, others sometimes known as Australopithecus, Afarensis, which basically means southern ape in Latin. And Lucy is basically exhibit A by evolutionists in their attempt to show that humans evolved from ape like creatures. You know, people today would date um, Lucy around three million years old. And when, interestingly, when they discovered Lucy in 1974, only 47 out of 207 bones were discovered. Most of her hands, feet, and skull were missing. So if you see the image on the left, you can see the skull is not completely there. There's missing hands and missing feet. And whereas this is the completed um, view of Lucy today. But originally they were missing all those bones. In fact, when you go to um, history museums around the world, this is Lucy in an exhibit at the Natural History Museum in London. But notice the hands, the feet, the upright posture, and the face. Uh, Lucy's hands are made to look like human's hands. Look, you can see there she's grasping um, some food. Um, she's got an upright posture. She's not bent over like a chimpanzee, but her face is still sort of resembling a chimpanzee's face. But the truth is that Lucy, from the anatomical evidence that we know of today, was a knuckle walker similar to a baboon or a gorilla. She wasn't halfway between an ape and going towards being human. This is what Lucy would have looked like. This is an exhibit at the Creation Museum in Kentucky. Um, that's what the anatomical evidence would tell us, that Lucy was a baboon or a gorilla. Now, I want you to, to watch a clip of um, a scientist working on Lucy's bones, a man by the name of Dr. Owen Lovejoy. And another voice you'll hear in, in this commentary is the person who found Lucy, Dr. Jo Donald Johansson. But I want you to watch what he does with Lucy's bones. Uh, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they're in an anatomically impossible position. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bone seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. You see there? The angle of, of, of the hip looks nothing like a chimp, but a lot like, after he took the angle grinder to the bones and made it look that way, how is that science? If a creationist did that, basically there would be uproar in the media. They would never allow us to get away with that because it's not science. But yet, if an evolutionist does it, it's acceptable. But that's what they have to do in order to make Lucy look more human. In fact, 
when you think about the history of ape men, basically it's a defunct history. You know, people try and argue about Neanderthals being part of that evolutionary past, but Neanderthals from all that we know today are fully human. They just would have lived post Babel in difficult, harsh conditions. But we know from things that have been found that from, from people who, talk about neanderthals that they buried the dead they um, painted things they made jewelry these are all things that humans do neanderthals were basically humans they weren't um, part of our evolutionary ancestry piltdown man was a hoax a faked human skull an orangutan jaw and interestingly piltdown man was used as evidence of evolution at the scopes trial um, in dayton tennessee that famous trial Nebraska man was made from a pig's tooth. Australopithecus, as we've seen, Lucy is basically an ape. There's no evidence that man evolved. It's just all imagination and art are the key to come to those conclusions. In fact, many of you may be familiar with this image called the March of Progress, trying to show our evolutionary ancestry. But this image is an illusion. It's not based upon any evidence. For example, famous... Um, Professor Bernard Wood said this in an article, there's a popular image of human evolution you'll find all over the place. On the left of the picture, there's an ape. On the right, a man. Between the two is a succession of figures that become ever more like humans. Our progress from ape to human looks so smooth, so tidy. It's such a beguiling image that even the experts are loath to let it go. But it is an illusion. Well, if it's an illusion, why do people continue to use this image in order to try and convey our evolutionary history. We should get rid of this image because it's an illusion. It's not based on any factual knowledge. But let's look now at belief in a historical Adam influenced modern science. You know, many people are saying today, you can't believe in Adam because of science. Well, actually, if you look at the history of science, science came about through a Christian framework at the time of the Reformation. In fact, this man, Rodney Stark, who's an agnostic in his book, For the Glory of God, came to this conclusion. It was not the wisdom of the East that gave rise to science, nor did Zen meditation turn people's hearts against slavery. Science was not the work of Western secularists or even deists. It was entirely the work of devout believers and an active, conscious creator, God. So he's a man who's not a Christian, who recognizes that science didn't come out of a secular worldview. It didn't come out of a deistic worldview. That's where God creates the world and then has nothing to do with it. Science came out of a worldview from people who were believers in an active, conscious creator God. In other words, the God of scripture. And so you can see many of these founders on this chart in front of you. Not all the founders of science, modern science, were Christians, but many of them, most of them probably were in fact you can see there the scientific method was given to us by francis bacon physics when it comes to physics isaac newton michael faraday james clark maxwell are well-known people you know when you think about chemistry um, Boyle, dalton ramsey and you can just go on throughout the list many famous names there in fact the famous astronomer johannes kepler said science is like thinking god's thoughts after him you know People like Richard Dawkins would say, the atheist Richard Dawkins would say, yeah, but that was before Charles Darwin. Well, actually, the people in yellow, Faraday, Maxwell, Kelvin, Mendel, Pasteur, Sedgwick, all lived after Darwin or were contemporaries with him and rejected his theory of evolution. In fact, James Clark Maxwell, one of the greatest scientists of all times, Einstein said he could never have done what he did without Maxwell, wrote and argued against um, Darwin's theory of evolution openly in his day. He's another historian, Peter Harrison, in his book, The Fall of Man and the Foundations of Science. Now, Harrison, again, is not a Christian. He's an, an atheist. I think he's either at Cambridge or Oxford University. But in this book, he basically argues that the founders of modern science um, were basically trying to recapture some of that encyclopedic knowledge they believed Adam had before the fall, which is why he writes this, for many champions of the new learning in the 17th century, the encyclopedic knowledge of Adam was the benchmark against which their own aspirations were gorged. In other words, they were looking 
to Adam, view and Adam as having complete knowledge before the fall. And in science, that's what they were trying to do, recapture some of that knowledge because they realized the fall of Adam had impaired the knowledge of man. In fact, Harrison goes on in his book to say this. In the 16th century, the book of scripture began to be read in a historical sense. It had a major impact on the way in which the book of nature was interpreted. Medieval allegorical readings of scripture had assumed a natural world in which objects symbolize spiritual truths. Now, we live in a time where theistic evolutionists will tell us you cannot read Genesis in a literal sense. It's, a, it's an allegory, it's a metaphor for something else. Well, at the time of the Reformation, people went away from that allegorical reading of scripture back to a historical sense. In fact, Harrison goes on to tell us the demise of the allegory and its replacement by the literal and historical approach called for a reconfiguring of the natural order, the intelligibility of which was no longer seen to reside in symbolic meanings. One consequence of that literal turn, the way in which the account of Adam's fall now read almost exclusively as a historical narrative rather than an allegory, influenced both theological anthropology and early modern science. And so you can see there, the founders, these Christian men, believed Adam was a real person, believed in a real fall, and that literal reading, natural reading of scripture went away from that allegorical approach and it helped influence, move science forward. Now let's look at why this is important to theology because Adam is foundational to many theological doctrines that we may not even think about. So this is why the first Adam is important to understand in the last Adam. Well, you think about the doctrine of original sin, sin, it answers in Genesis, we do this through the seven seas, which this would be corruption. Romans 5.12 tells us, Paul in the New Testament tells us, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Paul clearly tells us the origin of sin and death go back to this first man, Adam. And this is not just spiritual death. This is both physical and spiritual death. Paul doesn't separate those two out from each other as many people want to do today. And yes, Paul in context is talking about the death of humans, but he tells us that the reason that we sin is because we are in Adam. All sinned because of what Adam did. In fact, in verse 19 in Romans, he says, for as one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. We are not guilty of Adam's sin, but we are guilty sinners in Adam. Adam is the head of the human race, and we are part of Adam. We are in Adam, as he is the originator of the human race, which is why we sin. Again, we're not guilty of Adam's sin, but we are guilty sinners in Adam. But Adam's sin didn't just affect the human race, because Paul goes on in Romans 8.22 to say, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Adam's sin had an impact, a cosmic impact. It didn't just affect the human race, it affected the created order. So when you think, see things like tsunamis, natural disasters, we know those things are because of sins in the world. We see those things because we live in a fallen world, not because of evolution of millions of years, which you would have to say have always happened. Natural disasters, earthquakes, tsunamis have always been the way things are if you believe in evolution. You now that, that view of millions of years leading to, to, to man's existence through death, suffering and disease over man's actions leading to sin and death coming into the world are two completely different views of history and you cannot put them together, even though many Christians want to do so today. In fact, it's interesting, it's many of the atheists, many of the secularists of the age, which will often point out this inconsistency. For example, um, atheist Peter Bowler, in his book, Monkey Trials and Guerrilla Sermon, asks this question, if Christians accept that humanity was the product of evolution, even assuming the process could be seen as an expression of the creator's will, then the whole idea of original sin would have to be reinterpreted. Far from falling from an original state of grace in the Garden of Eden, we have arisen gradually from our animal origins. And if there was no sin from which we needed salvation, what was the purpose of Christ's agony on the cross? You know, that's a good question to ask. Not just because he's an atheist, but 
if if evolution is true then why did jesus die on the cross because you already have sin and death happening before adam ever existed so Bola asks an interesting question here see we have to think about this if there was sin and death before adam then what purpose does jesus's death mean on the cross let's think about the doctrine of christ and the teaching of christ because in the new testament in luke's gospel for example luke tells us the apostle luke tells us that jesus in his genealogy that he gives is descended through many people but ultimately all the way back to adam you can see there in luke uh, 338 that adam is the head of the human race is that the head of the genealogy and he is the son of god not in a physical sense but in the sense that god is his creator god is the one who created adam uniquely adam is traced back to to god and jesus is part of adam's race in his humanity he's descended from adam and you think about it if you're going to deny adam existed then you have to going to argue if you're going to be consistent why not the rest of the people in that genealogy what about Jesus' teaching in Mark 10, 6, where he touches upon indirectly upon Adam and Eve because he is talking in context to the Pharisees about the issue of re-divorce and marriage. Or marriage, sorry. Yeah, marriage and re-divorce. And, and um, marriage and divorce, sorry. And he says this, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So he, Jesus takes us back to the book of Genesis, Genesis 1, 20, Seven, but interestingly, he tells us, but from the beginning of creation. And so you have to ask the question, when was the beginning of creation according to Jesus? Well, if you look at this chart here, at the top of the screen, you'll see the beginning of creation here on day six. This would be Jesus's view. That Adam was created on day six. And it's only 4,000 years later where Jesus is given his teaching. So this would make sense that the beginning of creation is on day six. But if you're trying to argue for evolution or millions of years, then the beginning of creation, what Jesus says in Mark 10, 6, makes no sense. Because the beginning would be here 14 billion years ago. And then Adam and Eve would come here. The timeline makes no sense because it would mean that for 99 point nine 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 seven percent of human history people didn't exist so how could this be the beginning of history and you think about what the prophet isaiah tells us in isaiah 45 18 god created the world to be inhabited but if evolution is true then no he didn't that's wrong but we trust in the words of jesus over the words of evolutionary scientists Let's think lastly about the doctrine of the cross, the cross, the doctrine of salvation. We looked at Dennis Lamoureux at the beginning, but in an article he wrote on the Biologos website, which is a theistic evolutionary website, he wrote this article, Was Adam a Real Person? And in it, he tells us this. This is the gospel, and he's pointing to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 7, as stated in the Bible, and there is no mention whatsoever of Adam and whether or not he existed. Christian faith is founded on Jesus, not Adam. We must also separate and not conflate the historical reality of Jesus and his death and bodily resurrection from the fact that Adam never existed. And so when we read this, we could agree with Lamoureux that the Christian faith is founded upon Jesus. Absolutely, we don't dispute that. But you cannot have the Christian faith really without adam because he's important to so many doctrines and here's the thing even though paul states the gospel in 1 corinthians 15 1 to 7 and doesn't mention adam the rest of paul's argument in 1 corinthians 15 needs adam think about it paul tells us in 1 corinthians 15 1 to 4 now i would remind you brothers of the gospel i preached to you which you received and which you stand and which you are being saved. For I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. So Paul tells us that the gospel is Christ dying for our sins. That's part of the gospel, Christ's death on the cross. But here's the thing. We need to ask the question, why did Jesus die on the cross? Well, if you continue reading in 1 Corinthians 15, when you get to verses 21 and 22, you read these words. For as by a man came death, in other words, death came through Adam, by a man 
has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And so Paul traces the origin of death to Adam, which is the reason why Christ went to the cross and was resurrected from the dead. He was paying for the penalty of sin, which was brought into the world, according to Paul, by Adam. So Jesus died, not just a spiritual death on the cross, a physical, real physical death on the cross, because Adam physically brought physical death and spiritual death into creation. And Paul tells us there, for as in Adam, all die. The reason we will die is not because death is a biological necessity, but because death is a wage, a penalty for sin. We are in Adam. We are descendants of Adam. Adam, like I said earlier, is the head of the human race. But when we trust in Christ, we are no longer in Adam. We are in Christ. And then Paul goes on in verse 26 to tell us the last enemy to be destroyed is death. So according to Paul, death is, is not, a, again, it's not a biological necessity. It's an enemy. It's an intruder into God's very good creation. In fact, in verse 45, he tells us that this, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, not the second Adam, the last Adam became a life-given spirit. Why not the second Adam? Because there is never going to be a third Adam. There's never going to be a fourth Adam, fifth Adam. Paul tells us the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, became a life-given spirit. But he says the first Adam became a living being. He's pointing to Genesis 2.7. Notice he identifies that man in Genesis 2.17 as the person of Adam. Now, Adam is also important to understand and preach the gospel because Paul used Adam in his preaching. When you think about Acts chapter 17, when Paul went to speak to the Greek philosophers on Mars Hill. Now, if you think about the Greeks, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.23, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. Why was Christ crucified, the message of Christ's death, foolishness to the Greeks because for the Greeks they believe they were polytheists they believe in many gods so what was the purpose of one of the gods dying on the cross it didn't make any sense to the Greek mindset that's why Paul when he goes to Mars Hill if you read Acts 17 he begins by denying that there's many gods and he tells us one god made the heavens and the earth it begins by the god of creation which leads him to talk in verse 26 in Acts 17 and he made from one man, that's Adam, every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. That's because the Greeks, and Paul would have known this, the Greeks believed mankind arose out of the dirt in Athens. And Paul's contradicting that. He's saying, no, you haven't evolved. You haven't come across like this. You come from this one man who came from the creator. God is the creator of all things. We have our origin in one man, Adam. And then he goes on to talk about the fact of the day of judgment and the resurrection of the dead through the Lord Jesus Christ. So Adam was foundational there for Paul to present the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is important for us to think about today. We need to remind people, even in the church, that the gospel has its foundations in the book of Genesis. So when you think about this picture on the screen, Ask this question, which Adam is not important to the gospel? And the bottom you have the first man and first woman who were literally physically created by the hand of God who physically sinned against God's command in Genesis 3. And then you have the last Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was born of a virgin, who lived a sinless life, who did the miracles to prove he was the son of God, who went to that cross, who suffered and died as our substitute who rose from the dead three days later, conquering sin and death, and will come back again to judge the living and the dead. In order to preach those things, you need to hold to the first man, Adam. Both, of the, both Adams, the first and the last, are important to understanding the gospel. Let me close um, with this quote from the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a great English preacher um, in the 20th century. He says this in his book, What is an Evangelical? We must assert that we believe in the being of one first man called Adam and one first woman called Eve. We, we reject any notion of a pre-Adamic man because it is contrary to the teaching of Scripture. 
If we say that we believe the Bible to be the word of God, we must say that about the whole Bible. And when the Bible presents itself to us as history, we must accept it as history. And so Lloyd-Jones tells us the reason we reject any notion of a pre-Adamic man is not because of science, is because of scripture. Scripture is our authority. And so we start with a question, who are you really? Well, the Bible tells us we are made in the image of God. And that's why we have uniqueness. That's why we have purpose. That's why we have dignity. And that's such a message that the world needs to hear today. Not that you're an evolved ape-like creature who was related to fish millions of years ago. No, you're not an accident. You have worth, you have dignity, and you have value. But sadly, because of Adam's sin, that image has been distorted, which is why Paul in the book of Colossians in chapter 3, verse 10, tells us, that when we trust in Christ, that image is being renewed. That's the great news that we have for the world in which we live in today, that that image can be re renewed in Christ when you trust in Christ. So I uh, thank you for listening today and taking the time um, to listen to this message. I'm just going to quickly tell you about a few resources that may help you. I wrote this book um, a couple of years ago, Adam, the First and the Last, Responding to Modern Attacks, on Adam and Christ, um, very much written to a lay audience to help them understand this vitally important subject. It looks at many of the things we talked about today and um, a few other things. And then if you want to dig deeper into this, Terry Mortensen has edited a book called Searching for Adam, um, Genesis and the Truth About Man's Origin. This touches on lots of great subjects, whether it's science, theology, history, anthropology. This is a great book to get and give to your pastors. And then Terry has also produced a DVD, Eight Men, The Grand Illusion, um, which he critiques the, eight, um, the theory of eight men. And then Dr. Georgia Purdom has come up with this DVD, The Genetics of Adam and Eve. So if you want to look more at the genetics um, of, be, of one man and one woman, then do get this DVD. It's a great it's a great tool, resource to understanding um, the genetics of Adam and Eve. So again, thank you for listening and may God bless you this day.